and to say welcome, welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kichana B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. And I'm sure you just heard my chip strike clock. Strike. Yeah, the, the amen. The yes. amen clock. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we'll get started. I'll get this started with a screen share. Dedicate the study to Florence. Well, yeah. let's put it this way. We are not, she has not, please God, she has not departed yet. So if we dedicate this to Florence, we dedicate it to her, well, that's Refua she, Shalema. Yes, so. well, that's it. And the question, there is actually a question that when someone is in this particular state, it's there's a Hebrew term for it, goseis, whether or not that's a fair thing to do. But um Ah, perfect healing could mean many things. That's I, how I see it anyway. And let's, let's, can we dedicate it to her journey? Yes, but we, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with dedicating it that God have mercy upon her and that in God's wisdom, if, if, if it is God's will that she be able to come through this and give her a few more years. Uh, we have a person in our community who had passed just when I had arrived and she was 110 years old. She met Elsie Rich, made it to 110. So that's how old Joshua was and Joseph. So at any rate, if God will hear our prayers and the love that we have for Florence, and, uh, may God have mercy. Amen. Okay, let's look at what we're doing. We were actually in a... Um, Baruch HaLevi Epstein comment and that's back up here all the way up here there's so much look at all this all this material he has written which I'm still going up <laughs> wow here we are so um, I, I told you that I love this particular comment uh, that's, uh, that's that I said we could make a sampler out of this one that the, the default should be that what per, a person says to us should be confidential. We should keep confidences unless they tell us to, to share it. Or we've asked them, is it okay to share this? So, so we had the comment. I'll, I'll go over it one more time. And he's commenting on this pleonastic use of lay more. What is this lay more doing here? It's so much, you know, called Moses, spoke to him to say, etc. And what exactly, so what exactly is this lay more? So this is Amar Rabbi Menasya Raba, said Rabbi Menasya the Great, Minayin Lomar Davar Lachavero, Shehu Beval Yomar. How do we know that one who says a word to his fellow, that that person is can beval yomar, he cannot repeat what he said, until that person says to him, go and share this, go and say this. Talmud, how, so how do we know this? Talmud Lomar, scripture teaches us, that Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting, Lamor, to say. And this is the, so now we're on to the Baruch HaLevi Epstein. The Maharsha, so I think his name was Shlomo Idels. He is a, yeah, I may have mentioned him already once. He is one of the great uh, super commentaries on the, on the Talmud, on the Babylonian Talmud. And his commentary combines both halachic, halachic penetration and analysis, and also Agadata. He also has some wonderful comments on the, on the non-legalistic elements of the Talmud as well. So this is in pretty much all editions of the Talmud, you will find the Maharsha in the back of the book. Tarach, he struggled. He worked very hard, the Faresh Drashazo. He, he struggled to interpret this particular uh, interpretation of Rav, Rav Manasya Rabbah. Yeuyan Shan, and he simply says, Baruch HaLevi Epshin simply says, if you're interested, check it out. Vide, vide. Velinire, 
to me it seems the mefaresh hai lomar that that the that the the understanding of this lomar that we see kamo lomar notice without or lay more lay more excuse me is kamo lomar so saying lay more is should be understood as to say the Israel to tell the Jewish people that the way the drasha is working is they're not reading it as lemor, but lomar, the Israel, tell the Jewish people, tell the Israelites. Mashma, which implies, she imlohishahu, that had God not actually given him permission to do that, lo haya omer, Moses would not have said, have shared this with the Jewish people. So that's, that's his sort of straightforward understanding of this lay more, as opposed to the Maharsha's struggling to work with it. So, Uvesmag, that stands for Seder uh, Mitzvot Gedolot, I believe is the uh, way you pl play out this acronym. And it's a basic book on halacha and looking at each mitzvah and, and interpreting it and discussing it. And it's divided into positive mitzvahs and negative mitzvahs. So lavin on negative mitzvahs. Asin are positive mitzvahs, lavin on negative commandments. Tet, so the ninth lav, the uh, ninth negative commandment. Uh, limed mikan, he, he or, or lamad mikan, excuse me, limed is to teach, lamad he learned from here, he learned from here. She'im omer, uh, that if he says this without having gained permission or their beloved, he has transgressed a negative commandment. And the way he uh, explains the intention of this interpretation of Lemur is love emor, do not say. So again, playing with the language, playing with the word. Ukemoshidashu kahai gavna, and this is similar uh, to the way they've explained in this particular manner, the Psachim, in the tractate Psachim, Membet, page 42a, Uve Truma Zion Bet, and in the tractate Truma 7b, uh, there's the A side of the page and the B side of the page. There's never a C side of the page, just it's their folio pages. And it appears, excuse me, that <coughs> that when he wrote over belav, that when he said he transgresses, he violates a negative commandment, it's not, it's not that he's, you know, it's not one of the one of the 365 negative commandments uh, that, that one has violated. This particular negative commandment is not a commandment in that sense. All right. It is. It is more when it says asmachta. It it means it's not a mitzvah, but it's it's a good it's a good custom. It's a good habit. It's a, you know a proper thing to do, and that's all. That's all he meant by that. Oh, um, let me find out. Okay. Uka and we find similar uh, similar example in Yoma in the tractate Yoma, uh, page nineteen b. Kol hasach sichat chulin. So the similar to similar statements like anyone who 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 chats who just has a a non Torah type of chat. In other words, they just chulin would be non holy, right? Uh, a, a profane, but not a profanity in the way we understand it in English. It just simply means non sacred. One who engages in non sacred conversation. Over ba'ase, he actually violates a positive commandment. Why so? Shinemar, because it says in the Shema, the Dibar Tabam, you shall speak of those things. And those things we know are words of Torah. So it's a positive commandment to speak words of Torah. And so if you speak words of non Torah, you have violated that positive commandment. The law, this is the whole thing. You should speak of them, and not in, literally it means worthless things. So again, he's saying, 
This is a asmachta. It's not that, oh my gosh, I've just violated a, a positive commandment. I, you know, it's, a, it's like uh, not observing Pesach. This isn't that kind of commandment. It's just saying we need to be careful about what we talk about, that we should look at language, in this particular specific case, that we should look at the ability to speak as being something sacred, that our ability to communicate using words and language is a sacred thing, and we should be careful about what we say. Now, there are stories about some rabbis. I think Rav, he's a great rabbi, a great Amara in the Talmud, that apparently he never talked casually. If he had, and that's when it says non Torah, of course, it's not talking about if you have to pay your bill or if you're discussing a business transaction. We're not talking about that. We're talking about idle chit chat, gossip, those sorts of things, where we're just talking for the sake of talking. That's what it's talking about. So that we need to be careful about that. So Rav apparently never, never did that. He was meticulous about it. But the very fact that they point out to Rav is an indication that generally speaking, it's something to think about and to consider in one's behavior. But he's saying it's an asmachta. It's not a sort of quote, quote, real commandment. It's, it's something that's part of, you know, Part of things that we need to consider seriously. Uva Sanhedrin Kuf Yud Aleph, and in the tractate Sanhedrin, page 110a, here's another example. Kol HaMachazik B'Machloket. Anyone who keeps on arguing, right, for the sake of arguing. And in some ways, it's sort of talking about the way in which American life has, has wound up, where people are so adamant about their disagreements you know, that people unfriend people, people stop talking to people. I've known of marriages that have broken up over this kind of thing. I think that's what this is talking about. A machazik b'machloket, who, who insists on continuing and continuing a disputation, or verbala, transgresses a negative commandment, and velo ye kekorach karato. There's a statement that says you should not be like Korach and his community. Remember who they were interested in just undermining Moses's leadership. And so they came up, according to the tradition, they came up with arguments. And you know that the Talmud and the Mishnah are full of disagreements, but they were not disagreements just for the sake of a personal gain. And Korach's disagreements were you know, he was basically taking a populist approach. So interesting that he takes a populist approach and he says, how come you, Moses and Aaron, have taken such, you know, such privilege as yourself? Aren't all Jewish people, aren't the entire Israel, aren't they all holy? Populist. At least as I understand populist. And it's explained in the matter of these particular negative commandments, the Sefer HaMitzvot, in the Book of Commandments, Laha Rambam, one of the earlier halachic works of the Rambam, I believe, okay, Beshorish Hashmini, in the eighth, literally it means eighth root, but we're talking about principles where these people could extrapolate basic principles of Jewish law, and I imagine that's what it's talking about this particular type of negative commandment. So, so much for that. Uh, I'm open to some comments at this point and, and then we will move on into the Rashi, back into the Rashi. In a nutshell, how can we, how can we do that? And like with Facebook, I have a friend who constantly is arguing to, you know, just to, just to, just to get me just to keep, you know, pushing, pushing, pushing. Aiding. And I usually Aiding. just say, we're not going to see eye to eye on this. So let's go to the next thing. But is there a, is there a good way to just kind of say arguing for the sake of arguing is a, is, is, is a waste of time or a something or a. 
you you can try. I, Lauren, you were going to say something, and I'm happy. I just said it's called baiting, and yeah. I have yes. There's a lot of baiting going friends on. who do it, and and uh, and I think that really the best thing is just actually don't participate. I'm I'm guilty of constantly needing to have the last word myself, but true. Um, but if I could, you know, I know ph philosophically the best thing is just to ignore it. Don't participate. Oh and, yeah, I get. Usually, it's just a politifact thing, and then I'll get and then I'll get yelled at. You know. Yeah. Right. Well, what what yeah. I what I do when this happens to me is that I will try to um, have some pleasantness go back and forth if I can, and if not, then I just don't respond. Mm -hmm. I, I sincerely try. Um, I do too. I do too. I really do. I try to get back I, to uh, I, it's good for everybody, whatever. This is going to help so many people, hello. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I sincerely try three times as our tradition teaches us. Mm -hmm. And then I let it go because then it's their problem and I need to let it go. Lovely. Thank you. So, but yeah. it's much harder on the phone than, than on Facebook. Yeah, that's true. Because you yes. can think about what you say a little bit more on Facebook. Okay, so here's here's my thought about it. Okay. First of all, I have to be able to distinguish when it is a sincere discussion and a sincere, you know, debate that somebody's trying to sort things out. I mean, the moment it goes into ad hominem, right? The moment it goes into ad hominem, one has to, I, I have actually corrected people on Facebook when I've seen that happen. And of course, that's not so lovely, but I try to do it in a very polite kind of way. Right. But generally speaking, I might get to the point where I say, listen, I appreciate where you're coming from. Uh, I hear what you're saying. And at this point, I, I have nothing to add. Okay. And then, you then, I can, then, I, then I can ignore it if I want to. But I try to be polite. Uh, as, as Lisa said, uh, I think it's terribly important not, you know, to try not to bait back. Okay, and it is, it is sometimes very tempting. Uh, I did have a letter from someone who had been told that I had said something political, and this person wrote me an email and said, "How could I say that? What did I know?" And I went over specific details. I said, "This is the basis on which I'm saying what I'm saying." I said, and I, I also challenged back and said, you know, um, on what basis are you are you saying what you're saying, right? And I never received another email. That was the end of right. it, okay? But I'm saying in a person who is, you know, why people bait is an interesting discussion because, you know, because there are times when I really feel mm -hmm. like saying, and I love you too. End. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to, to, yeah, to end Yeah, you've got to be careful because you don't want to be flip about it. You know? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think know. that'll help a lot of people at okay. this juncture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Remaining, is, what, remaining polite. Hello, Judith had something yes, to say. I, I'm hearing her. Go ahead. What Judith. do you mean when you say um, someone makes an ad hominem attack and you say something about it? What would that uh, be? I point out that it's an ad hominem. I have seen so often in general conversation, uh, that's an idiotic thing to say, or what a jerk, they said, those are ad hominem attacks. And in fact, gotcha. I recently saw it was a more subtle ad hominem. And I'm trying to think, he's a guy from Harvard, he's very well known, Jewish attorney, very famous. Dershowitz. Uh, yes. Dershowitz, Dersh no yes. doubt. Dersh it was Dershowitz, thank you. <laughs> it's I always Dershowitz. So I received this thing where Dershowitz basically attacked the fellow who headed up the Democratic, um, you know, when they were trying to get Trump uh, and impeach Trump. And he, this was this Jewish attorney who spoke for the most part, et cetera. And Dershowitz wrote a column about an, an attack back saying, well, when his dad was up for blah, 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 you know, apparently involved with a student, uh, you know, incitements, blah, 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 you know, th they used an attorney who defended him on the basis of et cetera. And I wrote back to the person who sent me that argument, irrelevant, that's ad hominem. It has nothing to do with the merits of whether this person, I, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting names, right? The, 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 the representative, the Jewish representative who was heading up the democratic, you know, the, the, the house, you know, uh, the house uh, group that went and spoke to the Senate. 
It, Adam Schiff? No, mm-hmm. no, Adam no. Schiff. Adam, it wasn't no. Adam Schiff. It was oh. a I'd never heard of before. And he was extremely oh, okay. articulate. And, and he, he, he basically was the one in charge of the, of the, you know, the people from the house. And, and his arguments were extremely good. But the point is that Dershowitz, okay, in taking that approach, made no reference to the person's actual arguments and whether they were valid or not. He was simply saying, well, when you were in that position or when your father was in that position, you used those arguments. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's purely ad hominem. It is attacking the person. It is not actually looking at the arguments and saying, the reason why this argument doesn't work is A, B, C, and D. And I'm surprised at Dershowitz. He should know better, but it was a very subtle, it was most subtle because he wasn't calling him names. He was simply saying, well, you know, use those are irrelevant. I mean, because there would have been so many differences between who this guy's father was and the position he held as a, and the responsibility that he held for what he said. When you're president and you say something, that has a whole different weight to it than when you're simply Joe Blow on the street, you know, or some leader of a group and you're saying stuff. There's, there's little authority to it. I mean, th- those arguments could have been torn up, but you know, I think Dershowitz's arguments could have been torn up, but that they required also careful analysis, but they had no relevance whatsoever to the legitimacy of this person's arguments. Judith, does that, that explain to you some extent what I mean by ad hominem? Judith? Yes, it does. Thank you. I, that, um, I was uh, uh, not under, I, I was thinking of it as, um, what is it, straw man, and um, where, and um, this distinction is very helpful. Thank you. I mean, of course, the word, the term ad hominem means against the person rather than against the arguments, that you attack the person. And I see that all over the place in the insults, for example, you see, instead of just arguing and debating the issues involved, there's, there's implied or direct insults at the person for saying what they're saying and considering them stupid, you know, calling them stupid and stuff like that as well. It's terrible, terrible. So, so back to the times that we're speaking of here, mm-hmm. it is so related to family and community and face-to-face and speaking of each other when we are not face-to-face behind their backs and how we have that in an ethical way to guide our lives rather than to speak of those things in adversarial ways. And it's more from my point of view and the times about keeping peace and turning to God and getting back to the roots of loving each other. Yes. Okay. Uh Can I say something here? Here is where belief in this divine one soul, divine creator, is an incredibly powerful um, goad to ethical behavior. Because if you believe that every single, every single human being, no exceptions, no exceptions, regardless of their behavior, is created in the divine image, you have to, regardless, treat them respectfully. And learning how to speak respectfully is extremely powerful. And and always knowing in the back of your mind that when you are being insulting or treating someone and putting them down, you are actually also insulting your creator. Because God created all of us and God created the universe. But if we start off with, with just denying or not trying to to engage in the notion of this, you know, unifying principle. I mean, obviously God is far more than a principle and the, and the humility involved in recognizing there are things we don't understand that are way greater than us. And that's part of the reason why I think that, you know, behavior has gone the way it's gone. I'm not saying people haven't done stuff in the name of religion that are actually an abomination. I never would deny that, but, 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 that's an abuse of religion. And Lauren, I interrupted you or I asked to, to let, you, let me talk, go ahead. Well, I think that we're um, looking at this more narrowly than it's often intended. Yes, disrespect and Lashon Hara 
are bad things, but idle chatter is more inclusive. And for some people, um, for some of the, the sages, I think just talking about sports and weather <laughs> is idle chatter. Now, the way I look at it is it's bonding, but they would rather your bonding be related to bringing someone closer to God and mitzvot, which, um, and sports and weather and things, that kind of idle chatter can be seen as a distraction from the religious motivations. So uh, that's a very strict outlook and it's not my outlook, but I am afraid that it is sometimes what is meant, you know, in including, you know, when, when you're talking about idle chatter. Yes. I, I agree with you. I agree. That's with you. so interesting, Lauren, because from it depends upon your point of view too. Just like you were saying, if if the sports is going to bring us closer together, then that that is looking into your heart. If the sports is going to distract you from your problems and the things you need to do and cleaving closer to God, then maybe that is not a good thing. It's very interesting on the point of view and where your heart's at. Yes, let, let me just comment on this. I, I think you're right on everyone. I think, Lauren, I appreciate the point. I think the reason for these statements isn't that we're to take this very narrow outlook and, and just push ourselves to the extreme. I think in some ways it's saying we need to have some balance and it's fine to talk about sports. And it's not for me to, to, to judge others, you know, who, who, who spend 99% of their time or whatever. I agree. I think they're also positive. I mean, sports can treat, teach you a lot of things. They're not necessarily dvarim betelim, right? Because they can teach you self-control. They can teach you the idea of thinking strategically. I mean, there's so many, you know, life situations that sports can can bring out not to say that that's the ultimate justification of it but i think it's just it's trying to create more of a balance and it's just in some ways by doing it in this very harsh kind of way it's trying to bring it to our attention because the truth is most people wouldn't give it a second thought you know they wouldn't give a second thought as to what we talk about when we say idle chatter and then idle chatter very often develops into gossip and gossip is mean and awful and undermining and destroys. And I don't know that one. Pardon? Don't I know that one? Yeah, well, I think we all do, honest. Yeah, but, but it, it, it kind of goes back to the old adage, right, of, of think before you speak, right? This is reinforcing that that notion of, of really, you need to think before you speak because we, we all want to be, con we should be considerate of our words and especially, you know, what they, how they affect other people and also how they affect our, our ability to get closer to God, right? So, so I, I think that, you know, to me, it just, it reinforces that, that idea, which yeah. many people don't, which a lot of people, as you pointed out, either, you know, um, over social media or, you know, when they're more anonymized through the internet, tend to ignore. When you're in person, you may not ignore so much because you have a physical presence standing in front of you. So you probably do think a little bit more, but because of other reasons, but, you know, I think that's, that's kind of, you know, how, how this comes across to me. And, and it's really important to, to think before you speak. So this reminds me of a graffiti that I saw in the choir loft of Temple David in Durban, South Africa. And the graffiti was, make sure that brain is engaged before putting mouth into gear. Yeah, exactly. I, I've I wish seen I could say like I that. followed that, quite honestly, David. I wish <laughs> I could say that was something that I had really developed, but it's it's developing, let's say. I hope it's developing. So actually that's a graffito. Okay, thank you. That's the singular <laughs> form. You're right, of course, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that lesson. <laughs> yeah. I think we are are done for this morning. I'm going to stop the share and also stop the recording and look forward.